Each year at this time, we come back to Furls Creek to celebrate a homecoming. And it's uh, whether it's always been your home or not, uh, we're glad that you're here today. Amen. And I do see a lot of faces here that are new that I don't know very well, but we're glad that you're here and we're glad, so glad that you've become a part of the Furls Creek Church of Christ. Amen. And whether you're like me, been here for 60 some years, or just recently a part of the church today is a special day for all of us. As we look back, and remember and share memories of the past and certainly as we look forward to another homecoming with the Lord. But uh, 1903, 1904, a long time for a church to be here. I was in the homecoming last week. They'd been at Maple Grove. Had been there. They celebrated their 100th anniversary this year. Big Branch stands church where he preached has been over there. It's probably the oldest church in Buchanan County. It's been there over a hundred years, and we've been here. Looks like about a hundred and four or five some years. That's a long time, and. Uh, Three buildings have been here, and I saw the first building back on the bulletin board, uh, 1908, uh, and two men standing on the porch, and I don't know for sure, but I think it could be my grandfather, G.W. Belcher, because of the little mustache that he had, but I couldn't see the picture plain enough to know for sure, but he donated this land and this site for this building and uh, they used to churches changed a whole lot <laughs> they used to come to church riding horses and walking and uh, wagons riding wagons and I remember my dad telling about some of those stories he would tell about uh, about grandpa George's store and how he'd take a team of horses and go down to Catholicsburg and Ashland and get groceries and come back and uh, sell them up up here. And uh, Robert Neal was telling about one of the early meetings that had an overflow crowd. Uh, and some of them walked as much as 15 miles to get here. Yeah. Times has changed. Teddy Roosevelt was the president. Wow. No electricity. No water, they scrubbed with a mop bucket and, and uh, wooden pews, oil lamps. And uh, I was uh, surprised that some of the ministers that's been here down through the years, uh, Mose Hurley, that's Ruth Stanley's uh, dad, and he, he was one of the early preachers. And his brother, Sam Hurley, I did not know that Sam Hurley was brother to Mose that founded Mount Mission School. And, uh, of course, we couldn't forget the Thompsons, H.J. and Ben Thompson from over at Feds Creek. And Billy's grandfather, Alvis Ford, I remember him preaching at Elkhorn and, and here at Furls Creek and uh, of course, my favorite was Brother Farmer. H.J. Uh, Farmer baptized my mother. Uh, somebody was talking the other night about we didn't know if he had to uh, could baptize in that creek or not. They didn't have to. They had the big sandy river right down there. And I had a picture last year of uh, several that they had baptized down there. And one of them was my mother. And... Uh, E.W.'s sister sent me that picture, and uh, very precious. Jim Deskins, I don't know, you, preacher Jim Deskins, if he's any kin to you or not, Chris. But uh, Penis Hunt, <laughs> was he? Garfield Stump. They had preach him high sermons. <laughs> Hey, brother. <laughs> 
One of them, but they, they'd preach double headers. Now you're complaining about the time right now, and I'm going to take my time, and we don't have to go beat nobody to the restaurant today. <laughs> but uh, they'd preach a double header sermon. One of them would preach on heaven, and the other would preach on hell. <laughs> But all the preachers of our lifetime, my lifetime, uh, fit you loveless. And ain't Janie loveless. Some of my favorite people have been right here in this building. Hollis Branham. Roy Robinson. Couldn't find a better preacher anywhere or a, or a better man. His sister married to my brother and she told me that he, Roy had never said a cuss word in his life and uh, E.W. Dameron it's hard to believe that he's been dead nine years this is my ninth homecoming I preached my first homecoming sermon here in 2010 that's he died in 2009 in October. He died October 27th, right after the homecoming here. And we'd been up at the prayer clinic. Yep. E.W. Dameron and I and uh, Clinton Daniels. And we sat up all night and talking and telling stories. And then he just died. And uh, Billy, I want to make a suggestion to you. You've got another good preacher here that's a Timothy. It's Jeff Ramey. Maybe y'all maybe you ought to swap around with us and they won't get tired of me often. Amen. Uh, he's don't you see, don't wait till I die. The way they've done this, you'd one have to die for the next <laughs> So uh, I want you to have Jeff here before I die. Because <laughs> Belchers live a long time, some of us. Some of us is, somebody said you have to knock us in the head on Judgment Day. Of course, Dwayne Smith, we remember Dwayne. And, and uh, last, certainly not least, Amen. Brother Billy <laughs> has been here for 10 years. And uh, this building, the second building burned on a Sunday afternoon. January the 21st, 1951. And they borrowed that tent until they could build this building. And it was dedicated to last Sunday in November in 1954. To the glory of the Lord. Amen. And it's gone through a lot of changes. I remember the first building built, was built out of the old cinder blocks from E.W.'s cinder block plant right down at the mouth of Beaver. And they put brick, these beautiful windows, carpet, pews, the addition, fellowship hall, but uh, undergone a lot of changes and the Belchers and the Ramies and Ratliffs and Loonies and Branhams and Stiltners and we could be here all day, all day naming families and loved ones. And I, one of my f fondest memories is old Luke, <laughs> Luther, coming and greeting you and Shaking hands with you and handing a Aunt Polly, yeah. Arlie, Childers, and Melcy, and none of us could ever forget Ruth. I think we stayed in her, I stayed in her Sunday school class until I got out of college. <laughs> the Mortons and the Moors, and but they're just a few of the church. Families that's kept this church going for over a hundred years. So we we want to remember them, but we also want to be the generation that bridges the gap and keeps this church going to the next generation. Amen. And our goal is to be the kind of church that Jesus wants us to be. Amen. Uh, I like Gary Justice's quality foods commercials. Uh, we don't want to be the biggest. We just want to be the best. Well, we don't want to be the biggest and we don't want to be the prettiest. But we do want to be the kind of church that Jesus would have us to be. Amen. A church that loves God, preaches the gospel, and loves people. Amen. 
Well, I guess I better get to what I came for. Thank you again for having me. Uh, Norman, appreciate it. All the singers was great. And we're having a homecoming next week at Poplar Creek, the 9th through Wednesday night. Norman, come over and sing with us and sing for us and uh, be with us if you can. Raphael Farrell, former minister there, will be there. Let's talk about the harvest. Say not ye therefore yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. A lot of people was coming to Jesus, crowds from the villages and the towns, preaching and teaching, and he was healing them. But when he saw the multitudes that needed a Savior, he was moved. Jesus is not talking about the harvest of crops. You know, this time of the year we begin to harvest our crops, and certainly that beautiful moon that we've had for a few days reminds us of September and October when we bring in our harvest. And Jesus tells his disciples, uh, don't say the harvest is four months away, but he's not talking about that kind of a harvest. He's talking about the harvest of souls. And he tells uh, his disciples, and he tells us to look on the fields. He tells us to pray for laborers. And so today, for as quick as I can, and I can't promise, we'll uh, try to see the fields as Jesus saw them. Amen. The harvest is plenteous. This world is big, and Jesus begins by saying the harvest is plenteous, and of course the crop was the souls of people. This was the harvest Jesus was talking about. Go ahead, Carol. The harvest is plentiful. World population is 7.6 billion people. The USA now has the third, is the third largest country in the world, and they have 327, 165, 918 million people. That's of last night. China makes up about 19% of the world's population. The United States only makes a little bit more than four and a half percent of the world's population. And we have 90% of the world's wealth. The world population now increases about 150 million people every two years. Question for you. What is 750,000 miles long and gets longer every day? It's the line of people who are dying without Christ. Jesus not only sees the crop as plentiful, he sees the crop, the harvest as precious. He said Jesus saw the crowds and he was moved. They brought tears to Jesus' eyes. He had compassion. And that word is one of the strongest words that you can have for sympathy or pity. It's the kind of a feeling that you have that moves you to cry for somebody else. It's like the feeling you have when the doctor tells you there's nothing that you can do. It's like that feeling that I had, and Lois had, when we was with my sister in Indiana. And the doctor said, there's nothing we can do. Just go home and be comfortable. Just like hitting you right there. 
It's, it's, it's a, that feeling that Jesus had for the woman who had suffered with a disease for years and she had spent all she had on doctors and still getting worse. And when she touched the hem of his garment, it's like the feeling he had when that virtue went out of him. Like the feeling he had when the centurion came and said, my little 12-year-old girl is dying. The feeling you get when you see those little children with the swollen bellies and the yellowish hair which tells you they're starving. It's like the feeling you get when you watch those St. Jude's commercials and you see that little children with the shaved heads from surgery and chemo with cancer. That's how Jesus saw the crowds. Like the video a missionary showed in, on U European TV of an orphanage in Albania. And in this video, he threw out a handful, just a handful of food on a concrete floor. And uh, the naked children in the orphanage ate it like dogs. Two girls from Switzerland went down to that orphanage and they asked her why did you come they said we saw the video and we had to do something that's the feeling that jesus had that's the the look that jesus said for us to look but see more than just the bodies See the broken hearts. See their needs. Don't just see an adulterous woman like we do. See how sin has made her lonely, made her be rejected, made her be looked down upon by society. Harvest time is a time to look and see men, women, boys, and girls that need God. The 80s ladies and the 90s and the 70s ladies in the nursing home. We went to the nursing home this week and you'd hug them and they'd cry and Louise went to touch one of them and she said, please don't take my blanket. <laughs> she thought Louise was just going to cover her up. And she thought she was going to take her blanket. I sat down at one and we was eating lunch and the ladies at Poplar Creek was feeding them and we was getting ready to eat. And after it was done, I just sat there. The lady sat beside of me. I said, uh, are we going to be in here long? I just wondered how when dinner was going to be over and when the next group was going to come in, they were going to play bingo. <laughs> and I said, you going to be here long? She said, no. She said, I've got my furniture in storage. <laughs> she said, I even got a big poster bed. And she said, I I'm going to get out of here pretty soon. You see, sometimes it's strangers and sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's people just like on our prayer list with cancer. It's people that's struggling with a, trying on a job or an addiction or trapped in a marriage where the, the love's all gone. And they don't want to or don't know how to fix it. It's the feeling you get when your kids are sick. And you're waiting for the CAT scans and the MRIs and the blood work to come back and you're afraid. 
I think all of us, a lot of us boys and girls and women down here has gone to Chicago to work. Sometimes they stayed up there and sometimes we all come back. James Booth was the founder of Salvation Army. He went walking one night in Chicago. He said he couldn't sleep and the rain was beating down. And when he got home, his wife said, where have you been? And he said, I've been to hell. He saw the people, not just drunks, not just homeless, not just losers. He saw somebody's boy, somebody's girl. He saw someone except for the grace of God, there goes I. I've saw the same thing in my Chicago myself. I walked down that alley one day and saw a girl that grew up right here in the Furls Creek Church of Christ. Drunk, passed out right in the alley and hit cold. She told me, she said, Jim, I, I stayed drunk. Or I, I forget two or three or four years. She said, I said, she said one night at two o'clock in the morning, sitting on a bar stool, she said, I've got to, I can't go on like this. She became a, a member. Of, she rededicated her life or baptized there at the Lake, Lake Shore Church of Christ in Chicago and died faithful to the Lord. Now, let me tell you about her. She uh, lived on fixed income. When I come home of a night, I take my money out of my pocket and put it on the on the table there so we need to just run the store and get an item or two, a loaf of bread, pick up those quarters and things. You know what she done? When she come in, she took the dollar bills that she had left over and put them in an envelope. And when she got a hundred, she sent them to somebody that needed them. Or that she thought she needed them. And I've got one or two of those envelopes myself. If we could see our eyes, if our eyes could see the harvest like Jesus did, it would change our prayer life. It would change our life entirely. And I wish, like Jesus, looking over the whole world in that picture, I wish we could see that precious harvest that's still out there. And you know what? They're waiting for a picker to come. They're waiting for somebody to come. The harvest is plentiful, the harvest is precious, and the harvest is perishing. Like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus said, he saw the crowds simply following the crowd, simply following the current fads, the latest guru, accepting the next big idea, following in the new way. They don't have any direction. They're just... Following the world. They're wearing the clothes and the brands that their friends wear. They've got the new low tops. <laughs> They've got new lows in modesty and revealing more of their bodies. And they get more tattoos and more body piercings. And they try that cigarette. And they try that alcohol. And they try that drug just because they're trying to do like everybody else. They just go along with it. Going down the road that Jesus said was broad and wide that led to destruction. Some people say this about some of our people in our society today. He ain't got a clue. <laughs> 
And we can look at our generation and see that they don't have a clue. Look at the fields. I don't know about wheat farming, but I know that I've been told that when those grains turn white, they're ready to fall off. And without the pickers, they'll rot in the field. Dr. Roy Fish, he was a Bible college professor. His five-year-old son was dying and in the emergency room. His heart was breaking. His little boy, fragile, laying in the hospital bed and he, he thought about his greatest regret, what it would be if his son died. And he came to the conclusion that if he didn't make it, if he would die, that his little boy would never know how much I loved him. Sixty-one percent of the world is unchurched, radically unchurched. Radically unchurched means they don't go to church at all. Right. They don't ever go to church. They don't go on Christmas. They don't go on Easter. They don't go to church for weddings, and they don't even go to funerals. They never darken the church doors, and if they died. They would go to hell and never know how much Jesus loved them. Three weeks before he was killed, John F. Kennedy said, all, most all presidents leave office feeling their work is unfinished. He said, I have a lot to do and there is so little time. He was assassinated in Dallas three weeks later. Oscar Schindler, at the end of the movie Schindler's List, he said, I could have done more. He looked at his watch, and him and his friend got into this fancy car they were riding, and he said, I knew he could have exchanged that watch for additional lives, and he looked at his Jewish friend and said, I could have done more. You see, when Jesus told his disciples he only had about three months to live, so little time. You know, as the church today, we've got so much to do and so little time. And Jesus needs men and women, boys and girls, to take up the task that Jesus gave us to do. Amen. What can we do? We can pray for laborers to go into the fields, our fields. I've got a field. I've got two grandsons. Daddy, I, took, I drug them to church. You know what that means. But they don't even go to church, and I just love for somebody with a church bus to go by and pick them up or take them to vacation Bible school. See, these, these are our fields, our families, our kids, our grandkids, our neighborhoods, the man at the garage, the man at the grocery store, the man at the mines. That's our fields. We ought to pray for Bible colleges to train more preachers and missionaries. One elder said, if we pray for a good corn crop, the Lord expects us to say amen with a hoe. When we pray for the laborers, I think God expects us to say amen with go. We can go to our kids and grandkids. We may not go to China, but we can help send them. Someone said the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. Right. It's an awesome fact. It's an over, overwhelming fact to think, what can we do? Man walking on the beach saw a little boy like in the picture. 
picking up starfish that had become stranded during high tide and it went back out. Hundreds of starfish just stranded in the sand and this little boy was going along and picking them up and throwing them back in the water. This man was watching as he would do this and he called up with the boy and he said, what are you doing? He said, the fish will die if I don't throw them back in the water. If I leave them out in the sand, the man said, this seashore goes on for miles and there are hundreds, maybe thousands of starfish. He said, what difference can you possibly make? The little boy looked at that starfish that he had in his hand. He gave it a fling back out into the ocean and he said, I made a difference to that one. You see, fellas, we can all make a difference to somebody. I think about the people that made a difference in my life. J.D. Wright. When, when, when you couldn't get a nickel for an ice cream cone and stuff like that, and you got six kids, you didn't get too many nickels. <laughs> I went to church, and J.D. Wright had a grocery store in town, and he sat beside of me and gave me a dime. Made a big difference. We can make a difference with ice cream cones, with rides to church, visiting these people in the nursing home, in jail. The New Testament tells us of about 40 people who came to Jesus and out of the 40, 34 of them was brought by a friend. Of the people that we read that comes to Jesus, only six of them came on their own. So you see, we can make a difference. We can help him bring in the harvest today. There's a song that says, millions have come there's still room for one. And that one might be you. And the one that the gospel makes a difference in for the rest of your life and the rest of eternity might be you. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our invitation and invite you to come. Would you be free from, from the, the burden, burden of sin? sin?